So I have to say that that was pretty intense for me. And so I've decided to give my time up to David that you can just talk about what he said because it seems to me that it's pretty profound and that I, I, I don't know that I really want to be the backup group, you know, like the doo I noticed that I got the pink cards, so I wasn't sure. Maybe that was because of it's, you know, October is, you know, awareness month. Um, so here we are, each of us giving you our best stuff in 45 minutes. And um, I've never thought that David was the intense one, you know. I might have had a um, reputation for being sort of like that. So what, there's a lot that I'd like to respond to and extend from what David said. And I hope that during the discussion, we get to have some conversations about that or that you ask us about things related to uh, Smarter Balance. Because I happen to have been one of a handful of people, David was also, who actually got to respond to items on the Smarter Balance. So um, that's something that I happen to, um, to know a fair amount about. But what I get to tell you is my best stuff about vocabulary. And I think this is really, really exciting work. And there's some new work. So I want to begin with this core diagram of what we know and how knowledge isn't going to go away. So I think about 2000 when I moved back to the state of California and I bought a house just before the dot coms bust. And it was kind of like things were over, right? And I had bought the house right before and I lived very close to Silicon Valley. So that hadn't been a very <clears throat> smart move. But it turns out that that was only the beginning. And if we think of these circles, and the blue one is obsolete by this point, one of the things that we do in the United States well <clears throat> is we may have invented the assembly line for cars, but we don't make our own cars in the main. We may have invented blue jeans, you know, the 49ers, not the football team, but the ones who were looking for gold, but we don't make our own blue jeans. But what we do in this country is we curate knowledge. We've basically curated the knowledge of the world and it seems like everybody is contributing to increasing the amount of knowledge. Some of it's stuff that we might not particularly want to know about how cats do silly things. But the important point is that what's available to us today in terms of what we can know about is more than there was yesterday. You know, each of us becomes sort of an idiot savant with regard to certain topics as we kind of run, you know, fall down the rabbit warrens of the internet. And there's actually a new website, I don't know if you've seen it, it's called Learnist, where you can actually share some of these strange things that you've learned and become good at. So it's kind of a knowledge Pinterest thing. But no matter what a state decides about the common core, this knowledge explosion isn't going to go away. And from my understanding, so I served as a consultant on the early reading part for the common core writers. And keep remembering, just because you serve as a consultant doesn't necessarily mean that they ever really attend to anything you say. Because I serve unpaid, but I serve as a consultant, for example, for the airlines. And just last night, I gave them lots of good ideas 
for how they could improve their service. And they don't seem to take these really, really valuable ideas. And I serve in the same capacity to my nephews and nieces. I run a service called Free Consulting. So knowledge, I thought, was why the Common Core came about. It was a recognition that the 2000s aren't like it was for the baby boomers. Now I'm going to suggest, because of this knowledge boom, because of the digital boom, we also today know so much more about the vocabularies that go into text. And I don't want to just focus on words without the context of comprehension. But I want to suggest today that because of fields like computational linguistics, what we know today about vocabulary is very different than what Isabel Beck and Monty McCallan knew even five years ago when they, re when they um, re edited their book on the tier approach. We can gather together. I have in a database about 5,000 digitized books, and I have a software program called the Word Zone Profiler, and I can do all kinds of things, figuring out how those words, in particular texts, act and look like. And I'm suggesting because of that, we have opportunities for teaching kids about vocabulary in ways that we didn't have even a handful of years ago. And I'm going to suggest that in two years, what I say today is, going to need to be updated dramatically. My friend Bill Nagy, who knows m more about vocabulary than anybody else, I think in the United States at least, says that 50 years from now, and we recognize that probably Bill and I won't be here to, to see this, but people will look at this period as a very embryonic time of development, when we were just discovering things. Okay, So I'm saying that this same knowledge revolution the digital revolution has also made it possible for us to understand things about words in ways that we haven't understood before. I'm also going to suggest that when it comes to complex text, and my topic today is really about the vocabulary in text, it's not um, unpacking some of the claims of the Common Core writers, and some of their claims are dramatically incorrect about text complexity. We're told that texts have decelerated in difficulty over the last 50 years from K to 12, which logically is impossible because 50 years ago, no core reading program had a single K text. So just by that, the statement isn't correct. And it turns out that subsequent analyses, do you know that actually Pimentel and, and Coleman, if they had some issues with close reading, text complexity, my goodness, they really could have done some background reading there and considered some of the text. But it actually turned out that their foundation for making that argument was Jean Charles' study of the Scott Forsman Dick and Jane text in 1960. And they've dumbed down from then? I don't think so. Now, in high school, that might be the case, but in elementary school, no. So here we are, as teachers, faced with increasingly tougher texts for kids. And I think there's a temptation on the part of American teachers to read the text for the kids. When the texts get hard, you read it for them. And I'm not talking about read alouds of a great book. I'm talking about reading aloud the instructional text. And here's what we found from research, and this is a very important finding. When teachers read the text, now write this down, when teachers read the text for the kids, the teachers get better at reading. 
You know, I personally have outsourced my Pilates training. <laughs> and what I find is that it's done marvels for the person who is actually doing it. And sometimes she lets me watch. And that makes me feel really good about what she's doing. But it's not helping me. Now, when it comes to complex text, the most teachable aspect has to do with background knowledge, and background knowledge is represented by vocabulary. So when we look at these complex texts, like birch bark house and volcanoes, two of the texts suggested in Appendix B of the exemplars. Do you know what exemplars are in writing? I mean, they give you examples of how kids will read it or write at different points. You never have kids copy over the exemplars. These texts, the exemplars were intended to serve as examples. And who in the world picked them? Now, I happen to know that some of my favorite texts are in that list because somebody, because I was serving as a sort of free consultant, Nell Duke and I had a lot of great ideas for them. And we would just write them late at night. We would just keep sending them. And one night, they actually asked us for ideas of really great books. Did I think that I was developing a canon for first and second grade? I had no clue that that would appear in an appendix to the Common Core, which, by the way, the experts like David Pearson didn't sign off on. That was kind of freelance, the appendices. And that's actually where a lot of this stuff about text gets said, right? You know that staircase of text complexity and those wonderful things called lexiles? Now, where did those come from? You all know, right, that a lexile is almost perfectly predicted by syntax. And it has almost, you, can, you can't, but very little affect a text by manipulating vocabulary, which is very different than the Dale Chal and the Spache, where they actually had vocabulary lists that were associated with particular grades. OK, so that's kind of my preamble. So I'm going to tell you about words. So this is like seven important things that I know about words. And then I'm going to give seven instructional extensions for each of the principles. So I'm going to give you four, seven word facts. And if I don't get to all the um, applications, it's everything I know and some things I've forgotten are available for free on my website, textproject.org. OK, so, word, so seven word facts. And then I'm going to correlate those to an instructional extension. So word fact one, you know, reading is important not just because we want kids to read and swim well. What? You know, we want them to be able to read because there's knowledge in text. It's all about the knowledge. And the 21st century is about knowing things. Those who know are going to be the people who reap the largesse of this incredible time we live in. So like I said, I live on the edge of Silicon Valley. I live in a community where people are all working in this knowledge industry. And they know that their kids need to know stuff. But my point is that people who are involved in this industry, their kids are getting to know things. But kids in the 50 mile radius, of the Google campus, a lot of them are never going to be able to ac access this information. Why? Because they just can't read. And even the DVDs require you to be able to organize knowledge, right, and read something. Now, here's the thing. Texts typically have more rare vocabulary than conversations do. And this is a documented fact. Even a text like Good Night Moon has a more complex set of words in it than a typical conversation between college adults. 
Now, another thing about living in Santa Cruz, California, is I live three minutes from the Pacific Ocean, and my God, dude, the surf has been like so majorly up this last week. It has been like so unbelievable that like, oh my God. So like Columbus Day, that was just the start. And like we have just like so like not gone back to work. Okay, point here. I hear conversations like this. I've actually heard a conversation between two 40-year-old men that was just the word dude <clears throat> with, you know, dude, which I apparently meant surfs up. I go to a lot of coffee shops and I listen to stuff. I mean, some of the conversations like go like, oh my God, and then you know what he said? Oh, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> well, and then top off with, and then it just like means nothing. You listen to this, and apparently it does to the people saying it. Uh, but what's my point? You could participate in a lot of conversations and never hear about terms like volcanic eruptions or um, you know the causes or w the anticipation or what's the basis of an earthquake. Okay. or about participatory democracy. That comes in text. My second fact is that English has a huge repository of words, making it impossible to teach all words. Now, when I ask people why this is, often they tell me it's because English has let in so many other languages. And actually, we're not that generous uh, in the English language, it's really because English has two distinct layers of sources of its language. So English starts out as a Germanic language. People keep talking this Germanic language even when the French, the Normans, invade Great Britain and the aristocracy speaks French. When they say, we're not going to speak French anymore, which was about 1400, I wasn't there, even though you might think that. This actually comes from reading books that I learned this. But at that point, the vocabulary remained, which means that for almost every set of English words, like easy or cold or church or book, you know, Buch, Kirche, Kalt, House, right? Those are German words. I come by this honestly with a name like Elfrida Hildegard. There's, there's a French word which has a close derivative to Spanish, okay? That's why we have so many words. And you have to understand that pattern. Now, you know, y'all in Connecticut have had incredibly high achievement on things like the NAEP. If you want to keep on, I have to tell you that a lot of states are taking that little triangle and groups of teachers are having it tattooed <laughs> on their arms. So you might want to really keep this in mind. Okay, the third fact is, and this is really important, a small group of words does the heavy lifting in text. So it actually turns out, and this is something we've known a long time, but we haven't known it with the precision we know now, so Thorndike, you know, in his teacher's word book knew some of this. A guy named Ed Dolch took those ideas and made a list of words that have plagued young children ever since. Um, and what I've done in my work is establish that there's a group of 2,500 complex word families. 2,500, and yes, they are on my website. And please, please, don't make me and Edward Dolch for a future generation. You know, like who in the world is that Hebert whose list we have to memorize? It's there for teacher's use. Okay, so 2,500 words account for the majority of the words you read, and then we've got a small percentage of words, about 10% in the text, that give the text their, its uniqueness. And that's made up of probably at least around 88,000 word families. That's a lot of words. 
point is you can't teach all of them. And what I want to point out is I have actually taken, no kidding, I've had digitized major portions of all of the Appendix B texts, all 200 and some texts, and I have applied it to my 2,500 words. And this gives you a sense that those 2,500 words are very versatile and they have a very wide spread. Okay, so you're seeing here that even at college and career ready, we've got about 87, 89% of the words fall into those 2,500 words. If you're not good with those words, it's very unlikely that you're gonna be very good with any text that has a lot of hard words in it. Okay, the fourth thing is, I'm gonna make a distinction. All words, except for the, live in some networks, in some families. Okay, they, they, some of these families are a little bit dysfunctional. Um, the ones that are in the, um, German, in the romance part typically aren't. They conjugate really nicely, okay? But words live in morphological families that are at least as important, if not more so, than the phonological families, and I'm not dissing phonological words, you know, the patterns of words. But I'm saying these morphological connections are critical. I've yet to hear in an American um, educator conversation people arguing if we've done too much morphology. You know, we have these great, deba great debates about phonics, but never about morphemes. But it turns out the morphemic system, especially when you get to that 10%, for every new word you encounter, there are probably about four or five other words that are related. But somebody has to help you make those connections, especially if you're a kid who depends on schools to become highly literate. Now, words are in families, but I want to point out that they also sit in networks. So you in a family, and then you're in a network. And let me describe these networks. So remember I said there's the 2,500 words. What I'm going to point out, and this is some of this new work, is that the kinds of words that are in the other 10%, all of the texts take up that 2,500 words. Those words take on lots of different meanings, but they're there. But the words in content texts and the words in stories, that 10%, function differently. Which is why the tier approach doesn't work really well when you're getting into informational text. Okay? In fact, the tier approach doesn't work very well when you're with narrative text, because you've just kind of cherry-picked certain words. So let me show you here. In narrative text, there are lots of hard words, the purple words, but those words don't necessarily, just because the word is pre, the word preoccupied is there, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see the word gash in the text. Okay? So internally, there's not a network like that. Now, in content area text, not you know the kind of um, magazine-y kind of text, but in real content area text, you see here that there are words that, you know, if you see the word embryo, the word fertilized is likely to be there. And maybe something about um, infant or miniature or small. Okay? So what this means for instruction is that the networks in narrative text are synonyms. They're semantically related groups of words that typically have to do with traits or actions or emotions. Now, David was using a term, I forgot what word he was using, but let's just say that the author tells you that the character is eavesdropping rather than hearing something. I forgot what verb you used, but use something like that. That's an important insight, and it's likely more important than maybe some other word that's used very serendipitously in the text. What I'm suggesting here is that on the left-hand side are some words that come from a unit from a core reading program. But those words, like amazed, fascinated, and marveled, are part of a network of words 
that the author also could have chosen. Now the deal is that a kid might not know the word enthralled, but typically in narrative text they have the underlying concept. Okay? That's a really important thing to know. There's just a lot of words, and here's the deal. Most of these words occur about once or twice at maximum for every million words you read. But the idea will appear again and again. So the idea of being captivated and spellbound and enchanted, you're going to see that a lot, but you aren't going to see those words. So readers have to come to anticipate that a writer of a story uses lots of different words to create the traits, the emotions, the setting, and the way in which they solve the problem. In a real story, a really good writer like Chris von Allsberg doesn't use the word lethargic three times. So a lot of baby boomers, in fact about 80% of us, grew up with Dick and Jane. And in Dick and Jane, they had obsessive compulsive disorder and they always did things a handful of times. Like they would run, run, run. You know, and then some of our our musicians came, you know, kind of followed up with that and then would have songs like fun, 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 you know. But that wasn't real literature. Okay? In real literature, even if the writer doesn't do it consciously, they use a thesaurus and don't keep repeating lethargic. This is very important because you can't teach all the words. So when I go into core reading programs and I take the seven or eight that they chose, they cherry pick for you, like why? I have no clue. And when you go and talk to some of the people who did the cherry picking, they don't know either. But those words are endemic. They indicate something about certain parts of the story. And it's not that specific word the kid needs to know. The kid needs to know that authors create traits. See, I'm not going to get to the instructional extension, so I'm telling you this in advance. So authors need to, you need to understand that that's what happens in stories. You have to anticipate it. Because for every hard word they picked out, there are about another three they didn't. What are the kids doing with those words? Okay, now, in informational text, words are topically related. These aren't synonyms. You know, a mathematician doesn't use a thesaurus when they write a mathematics text. Neither does a scientist. They're not looking for a synonym for photosynthesis. In fact, the whole point of the exercise is to make sure you understand what photosynthesis is. So this is a semantic map from a project that I worked on with David, and David continues to work on it, called Seeds of Science, Roots of Reading. And in this project, you take the underlying s concepts for a unit, and you map them this way. And I know it's hard to see, but you see the word dissolve, property in pink, and substance. And around those words are words that, as you learn the concept, you come to understand more about the key words. And those words like to understand, dissolve, you also need to know something about substance. Your understanding gets deeper as you do more with these words. Okay? But they're not synonyms. And that's an important thing to realize. You need to develop the whole set of concepts. And the thing about these words is they, in social studies, depend on lots of discussion and in science, inquiry, and experimentation. This isn't just something you gain by reading. This is where some of the experience comes in that David talked about. The fourth, the seventh word fact, it sort of seems like I threw this in because I needed the number seven, because that's a number I really like. But it maybe doesn't fit in any category perfectly. But I want to emphasize for you that concrete words are learned more readily and retained more readily by everyone. You know, when little kids start to talk, they use words like water and mama. They don't start with a word like the. 
which is why it's so stupid to send the Dolch list home with kindergartners. It's a really hard concept. I mean, turn to your partner and define the word the. Don't use it, but define it. But the point is that concrete words are learned and retained more readily than other words. And when I have a beginning reading program, it's actually the concrete words that I start with. But not serendipitously, very intentionally, and repeated a lot. Okay, so I'm really going to quickly run through what I call, is it, is it okay if I go through this stuff now really fast? So you remember these seven rules, right? Lots of words. Um, can't, oh, text is where words are, lots of words, no way you can teach all of them. Words are in families, words are in semantic networks in stories, and in informational networks in content area text and then concrete words are a really critical thing for us. Do you know a lot of the words that I see picked out in those cherry picking lists, you can actually just do with a single picture. You know? And that's one of the things that I do. You know that on Text Project, we've got a vault of about a thousand pictures of really key words. So let me show you some of this. Now when I talk about having a vocabulary that you can actually generate knowledge about words, see a lot of words haven't even been invented yet. Right? When we invent something new like the internet, we come up with new words like the internet. Right? So it's not about memorizing lists of words. So for all those Appendix B exemplars, I find a lot of vocabulary lists for those. It just doesn't help you a lot. You learned those words, but there were another about 290,000 words you didn't get to. So one of the things that it's really important with kids, see, if I'm your coach and I'm teaching you soccer, you're actually anticipating that you're going to get somewhat better at it. Okay? This is a problem when my dad was, you know, 89 and I got him a physical therapist. He fired the physical therapist because he said he wasn't getting better, you know, uh, more agile, like he was in his 50s. Now, at that point, that, you know, he didn't have the right concept. We were just trying to keep him even there. But I'm saying, when we're learning a new skill, like I'm learning the piano, we anticipate that we're going to keep getting better, and we have to have explicit conversations with kids about the fact that in any text that you're going to read that amounts to anything, there are going to be some new words that you don't know. That's the character of text. And here's the deal. You could teach and teach and teach about close reading, but you have no idea what McGraw-Hill or CTB McGraw what topics they're going to pick for the passages for Smarter Balance. Because in reading, it's almost the whole world, right? And my point is, what we can teach is that when you see a text, and this actually comes from Park, you need to anticipate that there are going to be hard words in that text. And we need to have explicit conversations with kids about this. It's always going to have something hard in it. So that's the first correlation to um, texts have knowledge. The second one is you've got to expose kids to lots of topics and the new vocabulary around it. So I've told you now that there are lots of texts, it's, you know, lots of words in different texts. And now I'm going to make sure, and what I'm saying, I'm prescribing as a doctor of philosophy that American kids read at least one magazine article a day on top of everything else. Oh, by the, on their own, by the way. I don't mean for the teacher to read it. So we've provided a prototype, and I'm not going to go into describing the model for these, but these actually help with the 2,500 word families. But there are about 100 of these on our website that are for free download. They're on particular topics. You know, like there's some things about linguistics, how words work. There are things about um, human interest. 
And if you don't know about this, this is a good Connecticut boy done really, really well, David Chula. He has a, a not-for-profit in New York called readworks.org, and if you're not a member of that, get on it quickly, because he's got at least 1,500 free passages from about one to early high school. So I'm saying, why a magazine article a day? You gotta get kids anticipating that when they read new stuff, they're gonna learn new words. And by the way, people who know some things do better with new topics. So we wanna develop a breadth of background knowledge as well as a depth of background knowledge. Um, by the way, we have set on our Pinterest site, we have a set of free books as well that I've vetted. Um, so the third generative strategy is you need to help kids with these, these 2,500 words. And one of the things that we've provided for you at Text Project is we've provided 32 lessons with very common words that you use in classrooms like talk, quiet, loud, sit, you know, and we've developed these semantic maps to teach kids about the generativity of language. So these are the, around the 2,500 words, okay? I've got five more minutes and I've got four more points. Piece of cake. So there are also forms for you to fill out, for the kids to fill out on this. The fourth gener generative strategy is, and I think my treatment here is very, very weak, but we want, one of the things that really troubles me about our current approach in core reading programs to teaching words is we never teach about the family of words, you know? And one of the things that's really critical, if I'm ta teaching about talk and I'm teaching the romance words related to that, like discussion, I want to learn about discussant, you know? I want to learn about the inflected endings. I want to know that kids can actually extend their knowledge to the rest of the words in that family. Um, so there are 32 of these free lessons. The fifth strategy is that we want to teach kids about the rich networks of similar meaning words. And I have on my website, you know, if you taught networks around these 15 words, you've almost got the core vocabulary and stories. You know, mad, glad, sad, and bad, you've covered a lot of ground. Okay, so we're now in the process of providing maps that are similar to the, the ones that I've just shown you for these words. So I'm saying teach kids about the underlying concept and then a network of words, and the best place to use it is in kids' writing. Okay, um, this is an example of a semantic map where you take these various words and cluster them from a book. So this is one of those stories where they taught about five to seven words and actually there are about 35 words in these two chapters that you need to know about. But you need to know how the words fit with each other. Not just, words just don't hang out by themselves. They're part of an underlying body of knowledge. And I think the best way, I mean, I think close reading really occurs, I, I'm not gonna step into that, that's David's thing. But I was going to say something about close reading and vocabulary, and, and he actually gave an example of that. I think that's a really important. What would have happened if the author had used this other word instead? Okay. So in terms of generative strategies with informational text, we actually want to teach these as conceptual bodies. Okay. So we want to actually say, here are the words that are organized. I'm seeing classrooms with these semantic maps around where we're helping kids organize their knowledge. And finally, when appropriate, I'm suggesting introduce new concepts with pictures and illustrations. So this is from the tarantula scientist. And you could go a long time trying to, uh, to describe spinneret. And I'm saying in this case, a picture is a thousand, worth a thousand words. We've got about what? About 100 of these word picture topics up at our website for you to download for free. Um, so I'm just suggesting here that what you want to do, you see there are lots of concepts that if we can tie this together, 
and we're actually making semantic maps at the beginning of these now, okay, which can really help you as well. So in summary, that was all I know about vocabulary. I'm going to know some more in about two years. Um, so I, I, you know, might want to check out the web website then. But I've suggested that there are many more rare words in text than there are in talk. And what that means is we need to tell kids about the presence of challenging words and challenging content. Anything you learn, you want to increase your capacity. And in reading text, we're increasing your capacity. That's what we do here. That's our day job. There are many more words in English than there's school time. What we want to do is expose kids to lots of topics and the use of words in different contexts. I've said that we, a small group of words does the heavy lifting. We want to do something like I showed you with those word maps with words like talk, where there are lots of examples to see multiple uses of words. Words are part of families. What does that mean? You need to teach families of words. Um, networks in narratives are synonyms, and that's a really critical concept to teach. Finally, as, uh, sixth, I said informational text, the networks of words are topical. And I, that's where you're starting to really teach content, right? So there's not something called vocabulary, and then there's something called content instruction, vocabulary instruction, and knowledge go hand in hand. And finally, I've said, I, you know, especially for English language learners, so much you can do through having really good pictures. And because we're a not-for-profit, we've been able to get some really good pictures for free that I think, and we've really vetted them. We've spent a lot of time and resources on that. So I hope you visit us at Text Project. I apologize for uh, doing too much startup time and not getting to everything, but there's an article, I think it's in your packet, that David and I wrote about generative vocabulary. I encourage you to take a look at it. And I'd also like to say it's great to have my chronological twin in the audience, Linda Kaufman. So it's always good to be here in Connecticut. So thank you very much. <laughs>